following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Don't adjust your screen. There is nothing wrong. You are about to enter a world where the very concept of time is rendered obsolete by the sheer power of entertainment. You're about to enter the Bogus Hour. Everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bogus Hour, where I conduct a Skype interview with a comedian. She's been on The Howard Stern Show, MTV's Wild and Out, and Girl Code, the wonderful and talented Esther Koo. Hey, welcome to another episode of The Bogus Hour, where I spend my time via Skype interviewing a great comedian named Esther Koo. She started down in Boston. She's been on Comedy Central, NPR. She works all over the country, and she's one of my favorite comedians. So, welcome, Esther Koo, to the Bogus Hour. What's up, Greg Bogus? How are you? I'm excellent. I'm, um, it's really good to have you on, finally. Oh, my God. Thanks for having me on the Bogus Hour. I yeah. love the name of your show. Yeah, and, you know, you're, you're among some good company. I just interviewed my first presidential candidate earlier this week. So, Which one? His name is Vermin Supreme. Vermin Supreme? Yeah, Google him. <laughs> uh, how come I haven't seen him on any debate? I don't, well, he got kicked out of this year's debate because uh, the, in 2012, he glitter-bombed one of the anti-gay Republicans at, <laughs> at the alternative candidates debate. Oh, my God, I love that. I'm going to glitter bomb somebody. <laughs> so if you look up Vermin Supreme, he wears a giant boot on his head. Is he from New Hampshire? I think he's from Massachusetts. Ew, cool. Cool. So let's, uh, let's dig into your background about who you are and how you became a comedian. You're a, uh, you're a, a Korean-American comedian, and your family was, was, uh, was it right? They were Christian missionaries? Well, yeah, my parents were missionaries. They actually moved to Chicago to sort of pioneer and teach Americans about Jesus, which was <laughs> so bogus because they didn't realize Christianity was already a founding principle of this country. So um, I grew up in the church, but I also grew up on stage because I was always performing music, I was always dancing, and so for me to transition into stand-up comedy was, um, you know, I already had a lot of experience on stage. So you, so you are going into stand-up comedy, you already had the, which is the enormous part of the performance arts, getting in front of people and not losing your mind. Exactly. Like, I would have to, like, read, like, a testimony that I read about, like, or that I wrote about, like, all the sins that I committed that week, and oh so... Yeah, so I would always try to make it funny, you know, because as, like, a 13-year-old kid, what, what sins do I have to commit if I'm, like, you know, an avid churchgoer? So I would always try to crack people up at church. Oh, man, that sounds brutal, though, like having to be publicly confessed. That's some, that's some tough stuff. At least, like, Catholicism, you get to hide in a little closet and open up a curtain. That, getting in front of a microphone telling everybody what you've done, that sounds pretty heavy. Oh, I know. I mean, they just lay on the shame and the guilt, and that's why now my act is just so <laughs> shameless, and I will talk about anything on stage and just to embarrass my parents. <laughs> Had they known back then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, uh, you said you sang, you danced, you did that kind of stuff, and you did, you did like, the, the public confessionals. When did you decide that stand-up comedy was for you? You know, probably in high school, the kids came up to me, and I, I wrote on the school paper, 
and kids were always like, and teachers were like, oh, you're so funny. I always read your articles first. And they're like, you should be a comedian. And it just kind of, when enough people tell you that, uh, you start being like, okay, I should be a comedian. And you don't really think twice about it. It's just like, you know, okay, I'm going to do it. So um, I think that gave me the confidence. And when you're in high school and you're so young, you, you are full of confidence. And so I always wanted to be a comedian. And, uh, you know, um, I went to college, which was a big regret of mine. I should have just moved to New York to start comedy, you know? So where did you, so you, you, you grew up in, uh, uh, Chicago, but then, what, did you go to school in Boston? No, you know what? I went to Boston after school. Oh, where okay. I met, where I met you. Are you in New Hampshire now? I'm in New Hampshire now. Yeah, I'm just a couple of miles away from uh, Fody's Tavern where you came up and did a show for me back. Oh, my God. That in the was basement. awesome. Yes. Oh, my God. That was a great show. And Nashua is, like, the place to be. It's, like, the best uh, city in New Hampshire. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bustling town. And this, where, this is where the studio for my show is. So. I mean, you moving there must have brought it down a few notches, I'm sure. <laughs> but what can of they course. do? Uh, so, so then you uh, – I read also about you uh, getting fired from uh, one of your first jobs. Do you remember my job? Like, I had a company car. I, you know, I don't remember that. You don't remember that? You, oh, man. You, were you working for Sharpie and they canned you because you laughed too much? Yeah, I had, I had a company car, which is why I took the job to begin with. I was like, I just need a car to get to shows in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, is that, is that worse or as bad as going out with a guy because he has a nice car? I don't know. Um, but... So I had a company car, it had Sharpie on it, and <laughs> I would drive it to all my shows. And, and uh, you know, I was a really great employee because I was just, like, really energetic, and I was just happy to just be out of, you know, a cult. And <laughs> here I was hawking pens all over New England. I would go to the Staples. There's two Staples in Nashua, actually. I used to go up there. I'd go to Concord. I'd go to Vermont and oh, all wow. of that. Yeah, so... Um, I got fired because they were, you know, once the stylus came out and computers and every phone had a stylus, I think people just stopped using pens as much. And they were like, we got to get rid of this laughing girl. You know, she's <laughs> annoying. <laughs> One of the first ones to get ejected, huh? After. Yeah, yeah. Well, I still use them to, to sniff to get a little bit of a buzz. But other than that, I don't... Uh... I mean, I don't know. Can you really get a buzz from them? You got to sniff real hard. <laughs> yeah, you got to stick it up your nose. <laughs> so, so you started doing comedy in Boston, which is, I think, a, a good place to learn comedy. But you moved to New York pretty quickly. Yeah, you know, once I got um, fired from my Sharpie job, I moved to New York. Actually, I didn't get fired. Uh, I just say fired on Wikipedia because it sounds, sounds funny. It sounds better, right? <laughs> Makes you sound like a rebel. Yeah, so then I moved to New York and uh, and just started, you know, with the open mics and doing shows and stuff, so. Before we go into that, who were some of the, you know, you said that you were funny as, as a, you know, kid and in school. Who were some of the, the people that, that you thought of as funny? Who were some of the comedians that you watched before you started doing comedy that inspired you? Well, okay, I loved the movie Aladdin, and, you know, um, I would quote Robin Williams' uh, lines from Aladdin at school and annoy the hell out of all my teachers and classmates. Um, so I love Robin Williams. I love Jim Carrey. I loved Rowan Atkinson. Um, and Those are all, all real strong characters type of performers too. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get Robin Williams on my podcast if you know anybody who knows him. We will, uh, we could have a seance. <laughs> I, I do know a couple of mediums. <laughs> a few extra larges, but a couple of mediums. <laughs> so you moved to New York and, uh, and, you, and you really pretty quickly uh, uh, started working at different clubs. I mean, I wouldn't say too quickly. I, I started, you know, passing out flyers and doing bringer shows and, um, you know, doing what I could to get out there. And uh, I didn't 
I applied for a job at Xerox as a salesperson and they offered me a job and I was like, no, I don't really want this job. You know, like, I don't know why I even applied for like real jobs because I was just like, you know, being broke and being a comedian. So, which is all, it, it all goes into the part of the act there. You get to, to bitch about how miserable life is because you don't have money and you're doing crappy open mic shows at VFWs and, you know, coffee houses in front of, Lame exactly. I, I do enjoy the VSW shows, though. Those are always the best audiences because they all know each other. Right. And when you go to a comedy club, these people know each other here. These four people know each other. So people aren't as relaxed as, as a VFW where it's like, oh, you're, you know, ragging on Shirley. That's fucking hilarious. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll fix it in post. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> We're not live. <laughs> So. Yeah, so this weekend I'm actually, uh, let's see, I think Friday I'm at an Alpine Club in Manchester. And Saturday, nice. Saturday I'm at an Elks Club in Manchester, so. I love those shows, though. Yeah. I think those are some of the funnest shows, right? They are, they are, because it is fun because the crowds are usually they're a little bit, a little bit blue collary, a little bit hammered, and they do like to, they like to, you know, have you engage them. And they don't, you know, some places you make fun of the place and people get uptight. And those kind of places you really do, people let their hair down and, and you can kind of have fun. Yeah, I love, I love those venues. I haven't done one of those in a while. I should, I should uh, get back up there. Yeah, come on, do a New Hampshire tour. Do New, like, New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont. Do like yeah. The Redneck tour. Yeah, this weekend, you know, we've got the, the presidential primaries on Tuesday. So there's oh, going to cool. be, yeah, there's going to be like Trevor Noah is going to be in Manchester on Friday and Jimmy Tingle and Barry Crimmins. So all these guys are showing up to do their political stuff. What, what a story Trevor Noah has, huh? Incredible. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, talk about the American dream. Yeah. He hit the jackpot. Yeah, he sure did. Yeah, and I actually heard about him a little bit earlier than I would have. A, because I, I try not to watch a lot of, you know, comedians perform just because I don't want to get cross-pollinated ideas, but my nephews, um, found, you know, found him some time ago, and they actually showed me some of his stand-up when he was in uh, South Africa, and so I'm like, oh, this guy's pretty good, and then lo and behold, when, when they announced Stuart was leaving and he took over, I'm like, wow, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, uh, so when he retires, I, uh, I nominate you. Ah! <laughs> Well, we'll see about that. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, so a, a couple other things here. Um, what did the, the, the Wikipedia called you a, uh, said you're the Asian Sarah Silverman. Oh, uh, well, and, that, <laughs> I love that. That's cool. I mean, and that Miss is, Sarah Silverman's from New Hampshire. That is so cool. I mean, Sarah Silverman is just so funny. And I remember seeing her movie, Jesus is Magic, in Beacon, what, what's that, um, what's that suburb that Conan is from? Oh, Brookline? Brookline, at the Brookline movie theater. I remember seeing her. This is the first time I saw her in person. And oh, really? Yeah, and, and, uh, and then years later, like, you know, I would bump into her at the Friars Club or in New York at a comedy club, and so it's, um, that's such a huge compliment. I mean, I adore her. Yeah, and she's very, very, she's very fearless and very irreverent. And, and, and much of, much of uh, uh, what you do is, is that, too, that you're not afraid to, you know, to put things out there that, you know, won't necessarily get an immediate laugh. <laughs> you get some kind of a shock and things like that. And I think that's fun, <laughs> you know? It's got it's to soak in a little bit. Yeah, you got to yeah, let it marinate a little bit. But that's yeah. cool. Um, and then you've done you've done quite a bit of, uh, of of TV and radio. You did some uh, you did some Howard Stern. I did I did. Um, he had me on for the uh, for this contest. <laughs> that was years ago, though. I mean, it was like my first time doing a radio show. Like I hadn't even done a podcast at that oh, point. Oh really? So yeah, so I was super super nervous. But so so yeah, that probably like. I mean, that's, that's a big, he's a big name, and you're talking millions of people. That's, early on, that's a, that's a big, uh, that's a big step to take. That's a big place to go. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. Freak out it was, time. It, yeah, it was such a big, big show to do. Like, but you know what? All of our paths, like, they all go, you know, there's no one right way. Like, sometimes sure. you go do this and then do that first. So it's all it's all a learning experience. And it's always weird with radio is weird because, you, I mean, you know, sometimes where there's like an ensemble cast, you know, people laugh. But, you know, regular radio, you kind of, it's like one other person. So it's, you're doing bits and you, and you can't even tell whether it's funny or not because you're not really getting that immediate feedback, which is great about comedy. You get that feedback immediately as opposed to, oh, I heard you on the radio a week ago and you were funny. Right, because you're not there in everybody's truck. <laughs> like being able to like hear if they're laughing or not. That's why I love writing on the newspaper. I always wanted to be like a fly on the wall when the newspaper came out on Wednesdays. Like I wonder which lines they laughed at, you know. Like, but that's what I also love about periscoping now is you get that immediate feedback. People can press those hearts. People can comment and write ha 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 if they think something you said was funny. And that's like a virtual comedy show almost. So you do you do periscoping. Yeah, I, I periscope a lot. I try to periscope once a day or, really? you know, if I'm, yeah, if I'm traveling from my hotel room or backstage at a comedy show. And it just, I feel like it just gives people a glimpse. It's almost like an ongoing documentary that I'm giving people. Like, oh, this is me just on my downtime. This is what I'm doing. So when you're doing that, does it, is it also recording it or is it just sending it out? No, it also records it and saves it on your phone oh, so okay. that you could later go and post clips of it on YouTube or Facebook or something. Okay, that's cool. Because the only time I've only done that, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm one of those old dinosaurs where, you know, I'm getting into into the, the social media a lot more than I used to. So now, you know, I've got an Instagram account. I've got a, uh, a, a YouTube account. I've got a, uh, a Twitter account. And just, you know, that wasn't until last year that I started doing that. And I finally did, a, I did do a Periscope with Tony Moschetto. We went up to the... UFO oh my festival. God. We went wow. to the UFO festival in, in uh, Exeter, New Hampshire. They have every year, and so we we periscope for about ten minutes. It was, it was different. It was co kind of cool. It, it's fun. I love it. I think it's it's so fun, and you get that immediate, you get that interaction, and you give people access to you right. that you know people would never have had even a year ago. Right. So um, uh, you did Stern. Now, how about uh, how about some of the uh, the other shows? Uh, tell me about uh, Girl Code. Um, well, Girl Code was great because it, I got to connect with my female audience. You know, like giving advice to college age, high school age girls uh, who have cable, basically girls in the suburbs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, because I didn't I didn't have MTV growing up myself. Um, and so it, it's been it's been so much fun. It's been it's been great to be able to just give advice, and you know now I've been able to tour all these colleges around the country and see who basically gets ripped off. I'm like, you're paying forty thousand dollars a year to go to this <laughs> to this dive this play, yeah, this crappy food. I'm like, you guys are getting so ripped off, but um, you should be getting sushi at that <laughs> at that price. Yeah, exactly. But no, it's been it's been great, and it's been it's been I I I was so lucky to have been chosen to be able to be one of those comedians on Girl Code. That's awesome. And uh, how do you like doing uh, performing at college campuses? Um, you know what? Ninety percent of the time, it's awesome. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, you know, people appreciate it, and you know, they're like, "Oh, thanks so much for coming to our small little town," and they take pictures and blah blah blah. But then that one, you know, that one school out of every 10, it will be a little uptight and makes it, you know, a little difficult for me because they're just like, it's, it's usually like a, someplace remote like Wisconsin or Washington, you know, where they are all, they, they have no diversity in their school. So they're, and, they're uncomfortable about laughing at diversity or... Yeah, so if I make a race joke, it's like, oh, how dare she point out that, you know? And and it's just like, let's just be honest here. Like, you guys are the most uptight. Like, you guys need foreign exchange students. You guys need some black students. You guys need a, a Puerto Rican at your school. Something, you know? <laughs> Something besides cheese. 
Yes. Wonder Bread. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, uh, uh, what, else, what else did I have to ask you? Um, oh, and then there was another one called Wild and Out. Another TV show called Wild and Out. What was that? Oh, have you ever have you ever seen that? I've never. I've seen Girl Code. I've never seen Wild and Out. Oh my God, Wild and Out is the black SNL. Oh it's, really? Yeah, with rapping. Um, <laughs> so it was insane. I had never even seen it when I auditioned for it, but um, I click, quickly learned how to rap on YouTube. <laughs> really? But you yeah. just like take a YouTube, just watch a couple of YouTube. Videos yeah, like on, if, on how to rap. If you type in how to rap, you'll see some, you know, rappers will give you some advice on how to rap. And, nice. And when I quickly when I do learned... that, when I do that, I'll have to send you my rap. Okay, for sure. <laughs> um, so no, that was that was so much fun. But like those those guys on Wild and Out, they are so extremely talented. I was like way in over my head. I was lucky that I got to do you know a couple episodes, but. It was insane. And that's it. Nick Cannon is the producer of that, and he's on it, right? Yeah, Nick Cannon. It's Nick Cannon's Wild and Out. Cool. So, so, uh, and you did that uh, for for how long? I did that for just one season. Yeah. Cool. And then they all looked at me like, I don't know if she belongs here. <laughs> <laughs> You're off the island. <laughs> uh, so, so I. Uh, I asked you uh, what I usually ask. I'll ask you what I usually ask every comedian that I have on, and it's about the gigs they've done. Um, so first of all, um, before we get to that, is there anything you, that you want to talk about that you have scheduled to, you know, coming up? Any anything that you're working on that you'd like to let me know or in the audience know about? Um, yeah, I want to plug a date, March 3rd. I'll be at Harris Casino in Atlantic City, ah. March 3rd. Um, I also have a podcast that I have 20 episodes up online right now. It's called Koo and the Gang on iTunes. Nice. And I start every conversation with my comedian friends talking about poo, and then it goes from there. So, <laughs> so we, get, we get right to the gutter, and then we move up, up from there. Yes. <laughs> nice. Um, so, so um, what are your? What was your, the best gig that you've done so far? And, and you know, uh, as far as it, like a stand-up gig. The best gig that I've done. Um, God, I mean, there's just been. I can I start with the worst gig? No, because that's that's the next question. Oh man. <laughs> so you start with good. Okay, the best gig I've ever done. I mean, maybe, okay, I'd have to say when I got to do Last Comic Standing and I got sense. to perform in Vegas in front of 1,400 people. And that was my first time ever performing in front of such a large audience. And it was filmed, which was nerve wracking, but I also, you know, was excited and proud of myself. Yeah, doing those big, big crowds like that in a theater. You just you can totally pace yourself. You're not. It's not like in a in a club where you're punching away. You can like take time to set it up, throw the joke out there, let it wave out, let it wash back in. It's great. Yeah, it was great. And then with all the lights and the cameras, I was like, woohoo! This is awesome. This you is know? a production. So, yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's the best. Now the worst. The worst gig I've ever done. Um, God, you know what? I did a show in China that was pretty awful. Ooh. Um, they told me that there would be English speakers in the audience, and I got there, and like they could barely understand what I was saying. And you know, they're so communist; they barely have a sense of humor. <laughs> and so I was just bombing, and I couldn't. It was so hard for me to pretend like I wasn't bombing, you know, to keep my confidence up. So that was probably the worst. And then you can't like. Uh... Hey, how about that Mao Zedong? <laughs> yeah, and they, they, they wouldn't let me do my joke about, like, you know, the one the one child policy and all that. So they were super sensitive, and yeah, that's Which is, makes comedy tough when you've got all these boxes they want to shove you in. Right. When somebody says, don't say, say this, that's all you want to say. <laughs> uh, so that's the worst. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds pretty bad. Uh, and then the most unusual. 
The most unusual show I've ever done. Um, you know what? Somebody asked me to perform at an orgy once. Nice. In Brooklyn. And it was kind of one of these, like, it, I don't know if, how orgy it was, because I was, like, expecting more of a free-for-all. It was more like a older swingers club. Hey. Yeah. So, it, I mean, I didn't really see anybody fornicating. There were definitely, like, bunk beds in the dark with, you know... <laughs> Um, black lights and stuff, and I just tried to, like, get out of there as soon as I was done. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of creepy. Oh, man. Did you, uh, did you use the, uh, the hand gel after? And <laughs> I should, I should have, right? <laughs> well, I, I can, I can say I did a, uh, uh, me and Carolyn Plummer did a, uh, nudist colony last summer. Did, was it with Andy O. Fish? It was, no, 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 it wasn't. We weren't nude. I will not do that show. I've seen that. I'm like, I'm, oh my I'm, God, a, cause, I'm a pretty cause, liberal dude, man, but I'm not going to go perform naked. I just, I'm not that comfortable with myself. Because <laughs> Andy brought me to like a nudist retreat, not a retreat, but like a meeting once. And I didn't realize it was like a nudist. Oh, he meeting. just kind of sprung it on you? Well, he was like, hey, you know, my friend, we're, I'm going to my friend's apartment if you want to come with me. And I was like, okay, sure. And they're like, well, if anybody wants to get naked. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and oh. then a few months later, he started that naked comedy show. Oh, which is really, really, uh, the, the one thing, the, 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 the one good thing about it was it, it certainly made me feel confident in my endowment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and looking at Andy, he's not somebody that you would feel threatened by anyway, naked or not. So please put your clothes back on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's funny. So uh, it was great talking with you, Koo. So you can be found uh, on your podcast and you I think we're running your Twitter and stuff. Um, it was re I really really had a good time. It was nice to see you. Again. So good to see you. I'm so glad you're doing it big in Nashua with the bogus hour. And thanks for having me on. All right. So next time you come back around, make sure you look us up. We'll have you in the studio. My, uh, my uh, thanks to Esther Koo and her podcast, Koo and the Gang. Thank you so much, bogus. Bye-bye. Bye. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on The Bogus Hour, email us here at thebogushour at gmail.com. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.